said that like the the foodie community in the Bay Area, um, I guess you implied that it was quite cohesive. Like, how would you say that you guys usually like interact and through what like um, like events or what is the medium? That's a good question. So I would say I think that there are in spite of the fact that San Francisco is a big city, it's actually a very small town. And when you take the subset of the food community, it becomes even smaller because uh, chefs know each other. They've worked with other chefs oftentimes. Their wait staff has worked at other restaurants. And then the people who are interested in food talk about it a lot. You know, my friends and I, that's one of the topics of discussion. You know, whenever you go out to eat, you're talking about where's the, the next great place to dine out. So I, I think that what happens is there is this coalescence of mm -hmm. community that happens by virtue of the fact that we run into each other because we're a small town. Does that happen in New York or LA? I, you know, I don't really know. I visit those places. Yeah. But I would suspect it's a little different there because things are so spread out and they're so much bigger. So, um, so I think it's, it's that, um, that quality that we have of being a small town and yet a big city mm -hmm. where everybody runs into each other all the time. Okay. Yeah. And would you say there's like some unique characteristic about like Bay Area's fine dining scene and like the people working within it and the people enjoying it? Um, yes, definitely. I think, you know, as you know, we were one of the first because of Alice Waters and people like her to really embrace, you know, what now is sort of the de rigueur of the industry, which is sustainability, uh, local, um, in season, fresh, um, changing the menu to... There are two reasons I think San Francisco is in particular such a foodie town. You know, mm -hmm. from the very beginning, we were a bigger mixture of cultures perhaps than anywhere except maybe New York. And, but we also had a lot of influx from the East, from the Far East, which yeah. New York didn't have. New York had more of the European influence so we had the Italians and the Irish and the French, but then we had the Chinese and the Japanese and the Mexicans and everybody, everybody brought their own um, recipes and their mom's recipes. And so this was a melting pot from the early days of, you know, the gold diggers in yeah. the uh, 1940s. So I think that's one thing that happened. And I think the other thing is, because of where we're situated, we're very lucky. We have the ocean, so we have fresh fish. We have the um, uh, Central Valley, which grows, I think it's 40% of the produce in yeah. America, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the wine country. And so what happened because of all of that is chefs flocked here and said, well, the produce and the, the products are so good we can really show our skill better if we have really good ingredients. And, yeah. you know, we're the lucky recipients of that living here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that like, you know, California being like blessed by the environment, um, a lot of the chefs get inspired by the ingredients. So when I was talking to Kelly, the food photographer, she's actually talking about like when she discusses like how to photograph or what to photograph, like a lot of the emphasis would be on the ingredients, like how fresh it is, like trying to emphasize that in the photography, like that really exactly. hit the spot. Yeah. yeah. And I think I'm going in to talk to Peter or um, maybe somewhat like a marketing person at Palette this week as well. You should talk to Peter. He's an interesting guy. You know, he is quirky, but I think that's why he has this vision of mm -hmm. art and design meeting up with um, food. Yeah. So, you know, you can just tell he's a different kind of guy, but I think you'd get a lot of uh, insight from talking to him. Yeah. Um, and he's passionate about everything. He's passionate yeah. about the glassware and the flatware and, you know, the seasonality. He even hired 
a guy that I've been following who got his grand sommelier degree. His name is Jeremiah. I forget mm -hmm. his last name, but it's in my article. And yeah. Jeremiah started at SPQR, which is another favorite restaurant of mine. Yeah. And um, I have to tell you a side story here because it's so interesting. So I just retired from the PR business and yeah. our agency had affiliates all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I brought in our Italian affiliate to SPQR because I, you know, I wanted to impress her. And, <laughs> and uh, we get to the restaurant and Jeremiah says, oh, you're from Piacenza. I think she's from Piacenza. And Jeremiah said, oh, I have an, a wine from Piacenza, Piacenza. And Alessandra said to him, no, you don't. How, how could you? Because it's a small town, you know? Yeah. He's like, no, 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 I do. And he brought it out and he said, this wine was grown on the southeast side of the hill overlooking your town. And she was gobsmacked. Oh, she was like, gosh. oh my God, this guy really <laughs> knows his stuff. Wow. <laughs> Is it, so that's the kind of knowledge that a, a real master sommelier has. Okay, that is so impressive. I can never remember like the years or like the region. Like I, I don't know how they do it. I know. You know what? It you have to train a part of your brain. Yeah. And you can't just rely on Google because when you're serving in a fine dining restaurant, you don't want to see the sommelier googling it. You know, mm -hmm. you want somebody who really knows it so well that yeah. they can take your taste and your interest and your palate and yeah. figure out what will go with the food you've chosen. Okay. It's nice. pretty impressive. It is so <laughs> impressive. Wow. I, I'm really like, I'm really glad that Peter got um, Jeremiah at Palette now. So like, yeah, I don't everything. know if he's still there because with COVID you never know. But, oh yeah. yeah, that's true. So much turnover. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess you said so many interesting things. Now I have to like go back to all of them. <laughs> um, yeah. And I've been writing them down. So like you said earlier that, you know, like um, the Bay area specifically being so diverse with like cultures and influx from the East. Like I did notice that there's a lot of like fusion food. Um, but what do you think it means to be like new American today? Like for a restaurant to be new American? Well, uh uh, that's an interesting concept. And I think different people and different regions and different chefs would apply that term differently. Mm -hmm. How I would define it is taking traditional cooking, like say the burger yeah, and reinventing it in a way, you know, people like Daniel Ballou uh, reinvented the burger yeah. with putting foie gras on it. Yeah. And, um, and that's a very different kind of, you know, it's a fine dining experience as opposed to a ballpark experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of new American in that vein, people, chefs who are really thinking about, I love the tradition, but how do I, how do I manifest that in an innovative way? Yeah. Okay. And I think like Peter does it so well, because I was also hearing from Kelly who, worked with Peter many times, like he has a fine arts background and he's very intentional about every single detail in his restaurant. He is. Yeah. When you, uh, I don't know if you've been there yet. Have you been to Palette at all? No, uh, no I haven't. Admiring from afar right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that's great about it is, uh, you know, uh, as you probably read in my article, we have a couple of dogs. And so we always wanted to eat outside. Plus with COVID, it was yeah. better to eat outside. And uh, they weren't open inside when I did the article. Yeah. Um, and But when you start walking down the street, you see this black and white awning that dominates yeah. the block. And there's a black and white mural that he commissioned from an artist that is so vibrant. You know, it's this gorgeous super graphic that mm -hmm. grabs your attention and focus. And he's really smart because that's a great marketing tool. Yeah, You know, when you're driving by on Folsom Street or on 4th, you're going to see that and you're going to say, what is that? That looks really interesting. Mm -hmm. And you'll want to try it. It's like the old days when people would take out billboards or something like that. It's yeah. sort of like yeah. he's created his restaurant as a billboard for uh, culinary 
excellence and design. Um, so what was the process and like your experience, like writing that article, like, um, like talking to him, did you have to like set up a meeting or do you just show up at the restaurant and be like, Hey, can I talk to the chef? Like, what was that like? Yeah. So, um, that's a very good question. And what I like to do is work with professional public relations people who represent chefs and restaurants because they know and understand my needs. They mm -hmm. know and understand I'm going to have to talk to somebody high up Yeah. that, you know, I have a deadline that yeah. I'm going to need photos. Um, and they know that I have to work quickly too, because yeah. um, even though I don't work for a daily newspaper, I work for a, a paper where I write twice a month. And, you know, it is hard to schedule Think about it, you know, mm -hmm. chefs, I don't know how they do it. They're yeah. working from seven in the morning till midnight every night. Yeah. And it's like, this is the last thing they need to worry about, but they know they do need to worry about it for their customer base. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I always approach the PR people first, and sometimes there isn't a PR person, and then I'll go directly to the restaurant. And yeah. I always do my research beforehand. So I'll research both the restaurant and its history. I'll look at their website. I'll look at the chef's background and his history. I'll ask the PR people for any background materials if they have it. Sometimes yeah. they do, sometimes they don't. So I have to do my own research. Yeah. And then what I always do is I, I really take time to think about what would make a good story. So when it comes yeah. to say palette, what I thought about is everybody else is going to go in and say, how was the food and review the food mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe talk to the chef, but yeah. that wasn't my goal. My goal was really what makes this restaurant different. And what makes it different is that nexus of design and um, culinary innovation. Yeah. Oh my you God. always have to think about what's the story you want to tell mm -hmm. and who is your audience yeah. And how can you tell that story to your audience? Yeah. So what's the goal for this presentation and who is your audience? Yeah. So the goal of the presentation is just like share the research at like a space for a bunch of like uh, basically your classmates or friends and then professors and like people who might have been involved in the research. I'll send you an invite if you would like to come to it too. Oh. Or if you want well, to attend nice. Zoom. Yeah. That, that would be really nice. But I'm going to push you a little bit. Yeah. That's not really a goal. That's a tactic. Yes. So the goal is what do you want the audience to come away with? Yeah. Um, I kind of, okay. So I wanted to showcase how, like, first of all, Bay Area's fine dining scene is different from anywhere else in the world. That's like the message that I kind of wanted to communicate. Second, I want to talk about like how fine dining in itself is an artistic expression and like how chefs can have the ability to not only express themselves, but help artists, other artists express themselves through incorporating them into their restaurant design. Um, because I think like specifically looking at the art scene in the Bay Area, I think compared to like LA or New York or internationally where there's a lot of like art market penetration and like there's more commercial opportunities for artists, Bay Area artists are getting priced out and they don't, I don't think that a lot of them at least don't really have that access or that platform to showcase their work. And like I think having a restaurant like, you know, collaborate with artists, like that kind of collaboration is so important for both the chef like the concept of the restaurant, what they want to convey to the eaters, but also to the artists who might get the opportunity from a restaurant, especially high-end one. So that is the goal. Yeah. You just articulated it beautifully. It's not about, you know, the Bay Area dining scene. It's not about artists. It's about how artists and chefs can unite to support the community here in a way that's different from other places. And yeah. I think if you go with that theme, I think that's a brilliant theme. And I think, you know, if you start from that, all the other research is going to fall into place. Okay. And I want to do it through Pallet because I think Pallet is the best yeah. example in the Bay Area. It's a very good example. It really yeah. is because you can pull in artists and commissions and, you know, 
I mean, he's doing the glassware and the flatware and everything else. And yeah. they're one of a kind and, and even the look of the restaurant. And I would say you should visit the restaurant physically before you do your paper or your presentation because okay. it will it'll give you a different impression. Okay. And if you could even meet Peter in person, even for 10 minutes when I you hope. go to the restaurant, yeah, yeah, I'm sure he would. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, wow, great. <laughs> this has been like the best conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Annie. It's really, I want to stay in touch with you. You know, if I can help at any point in your career. Yeah. All right. Well, nice to meet you, Annie. You take yeah. it easy, okay? Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much, David. All right. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye.